Um, I just want to say, um, we, 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 I want to give out a thank you on behalf of SoCo Films. Um, we have recently blasted through 25,000 subscribers and we continue to grow massively. Um, and that is down to you, uh, our, our faithful, loyal subscribers who are sharing the video, liking the videos when they come out and are exposing other people to the videos. Uh, and that includes all of all of our hecklers and our trolls who weekly come on and, and uh, hecklers, tacklers, uh, and try to ruin our live streams with your nonsense. Um, we want to we want to say thank you to all of those uh, viewers who are not Christians yet, whether they're Muslim or atheist, who have been with us week after week after week, some of you supporting us at different levels. We just want to say, you know, you're more than welcome and we hope that you'll take what we're talking about, uh, take what you're talking about, take what we're talking about to, uh, to another level. So please do continue to like, please do continue to subscribe, please do continue to share our videos uh, and support us in the comment section. Um, the, the future of SoCo Films is to evolve out of um, Speaker's Corner. We want to take this and start doing documentaries uh, connected to the issues of Islam and Christianity. We want to start doing um, interviews about current affairs. We want to start doing talks uh, like you've seen at Edinburgh University and other places. And we want to start doing um, debates and more live streams. But to do that, we're still trying to find an office uh, somewhere within the circle line of central London where we can where we can use it on a weekly basis for a few hours every week um, to do what we need to do we also want to do some more talks with people uh, from uh, you know bigger names than ourselves like Jay Smith Sam Shamoon uh, David Wood um, we haven't yet reached out to these people so they might see this video before they even receive an email so they'll have time to pray and, and reflect about that uh, and we'd like to do some joint shows talking with others as well as continue to do interviews of ex-Muslims and to raise the plight of our persecuted brothers and sisters. So that's the objective and we're, we're setting ourselves the goal of doing that over the, eight, the next eight months. We are pressing, we are uh, reaching out to people um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can get in touch with me directly through btbsoco at gmail.com and you can add me on Hangouts. Um, and if you feel that you're called to support us financially, uh, there's the options in the information box underneath. There's two links, one that, that supports the channel and JC and one that supports uh, myself. And we're, we're moving towards the idea of doing this full time. Uh, and then you'll see both the quality and number of programs increase. The idea being to set up a, a Christian uh, media production company that, that has a Christian angle on things like Islamization, on, on uh, the events that are going off in our world from a Christian perspective and covering stories within the Christian world that affect the church. And we've got to where we are because of you guys and we just want to say thank you and that's the way that we're going to go forward. And that does include, of course, uh, using Patreon and we, we've got some plans to do some training seminars to do that. Now, I owe someone off camera an apology, so I'm going to just go and apologize to him. Um, I want to do a talk on um, why, if you're a Christian, you should ask yourself if you're part of a pyramid scheme. And if you are part of a pyramid scheme, why you need to leave it. And I'm not talking about a pyramid scheme that is happening out in the secular world where people are conning people in, in, in the world of work. I'm talking about the kind of con artists that are setting up churches that are essentially pyramid schemes. And if you want to see what uh, this kind of looks like in real life, then go and look at churches like Creflo Dollar that were set up by Creflo Dollar or Jesse Duplantis or a number of other individuals who have set up churches in America and it's rampant right throughout Nigeria, this idea of the prosperity gospel, where people are teaching that Christianity is a way of getting rich and that if you tithe 10% to your pastor, that that means that you will be blessed and that you will have a blessing greater because of the money that you've given to your pastor that you will become rich. 
Now, I, I want to say straight from the outset that if you're part of such a church, you need to leave it. It's a con. That, that kind of fellowship is not a fellowship that is built upon the Christian faith or upon the apostolic teaching. It is built upon the erroneous teachings of those individuals. And I want to talk about what are sort of biblical attitudes to richness. Um, I just want to ask JC, do you think we need to move that way a bit with the bell? Okay. Yeah, we're all right. Okay. So in terms of in terms of um, the Christian teaching, I want to look at actually, you know, the narrative that you're probably not being told if you're part of those kinds of fellowships and you're hearing that on Sunday to Sunday. Um, but I, I'm fully conscious that the chances are most of our viewers don't buy into this nonsense. So consider this a video that you can use um, when you encounter a Christian who has been duped by this nonsense that you can share with them and that you can share on their websites and on their media forums so that their followers can hear it. And I also want to make a distinction between what is appropriate levels of support for those that are working for the church and the kingdom of God and those that are abusing Christian teaching about um, making money for a blessing uh, and abusing the teaching on the tithe. So just to begin with, it is appropriate that those that are working for the church and the kingdom of God be supported by the fellowships. That is a biblical teaching. But people like Preflo Dollar and some of these American pastors and a lot of the, 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 the kind of churches that we hear about in Nigeria are teaching that, that if you tithe to the pastor 10%, that God is going to give back to you a, a, a greater amount of money. And they've turned the idea of being Christian into a kind of spiritual pyramid scheme. However, they do that by ignoring certain passages of scripture that I am now going to talk about. Uh, and, I, and I just want to draw them out to you. So starting in Matthew 19, verse 23 and 24, and obviously you're invited to study these passages in greater detail. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's quite clear because a man who has become rich is a man who has concerns more than the kingdom of God. He has concerns more than the kingdom. If he's got to look after 20 odd houses and 16 business interests and seven portfolios, this kind of man is going to struggle to find time for his prayers. He's going to struggle to find time to reflect in on himself and about his own character. He's going to find time to struggle to evangelize. He's going to find time to struggle to give alms and to fast. This is the kind of man whose concerns are consumed by his riches. And it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, even to the point of it being a case that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, it doesn't mean that it is impossible for rich men to enter the kingdom of God, nor for rich men to use their riches for the purposes of God's kingdom. The Bible gives an example of that also in the Gospel of Matthew, where it, um, if you just bear with me, I'll get the verse. So an example of that would be Matthew 27, verse uh, from 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. So clearly, whilst Christ has said that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, it is an impossible. Indeed, when Christ said that it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, the, uh, the, uh, the apostles that were surrounding him said, well, who then can be saved? They were astonished. And Jesus said, with man, oh, this is impossible. With, with, with God, all things are possible. And we see that there was a rich man who took Jesus 
and buried him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. So he had used his own money to bless Christ. And so the way for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven is to use his riches for that kingdom, to use his riches to alleviate his persecuted brothers and sisters, to use his riches to further the kingdom of heaven in terms of supporting the missionaries and the evangelists and setting Christian captives free from slavery, from supporting Christians who are being persecuted or discriminated by using their funds to help the poor of their fellowships. Your riches are a gift, but they aren't a gift about you. It's not about your blessing. Regardless of what these prosperity gospel preachers teach you, the idea of wealth is not for your benefit. The idea of wealth is for the cause of the church and the kingdom of God. Now, it goes on. In Luke 1, verse 53, Christ said, he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. So our God has filled the poor with good things and we'll come on to what those good things are, but he has sent the rich away empty. Why? Because those that are consumed by their wealth, their soul is twisted, their soul is, is distorted and they are filled with a kind of pride that prevents them from receiving from God. And so God has sent them away empty. Christ goes on to say in Luke 6, 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. These are part of the woes that Christ talks about. Those that are rich have and, and are using their rich for themselves have been rewarded in full for any good that they have done. God owes them nothing. He only owes them recompense for their sins because their riches has filled their heart with pride. They have been consumed by lust, by greed, and they have failed to do their obligations to the poor. The Christian faith teaches about a, a solidarity with the poor. Christ goes on to say, Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist in his possessions. Now, this contradicts the very idea that we are taught constantly in the West. Constantly, the message that we receive from Western consumerism is that we are defined by what we do by what we own and by what we possess. If you have the right clothes, if you have the right holidays, if you have the right status profession, these are the things that are, are lauded in our society. But Christ is clear, woe, beware, guard yourself against greed. Guard your heart against being consumed with the desire to define yourself by the things that you possess rather than by things that are higher and richer. And we'll come on to what those are. And he says that the reason for this is life does not consist of your possessions. So the things that you own do not make the man. You aren't the better man because you drive the flash car. You aren't the better man because you have the more fashionable clothes. You aren't a better man because you're a lawyer and the person worshipping next to you is still looking for a job. No, actually, these are not the measures of manhood. These are not the measures by which we understand what a man is. By contrast, the Christian faith teaches that you were born with a dignity because you were made in the image of God. That is a dignity that you had at your birth when you owned nothing and did nothing and were dependent on others. And there's nothing you can do to add to that dignity, though there are things that you can do that can take it away. So, we go on. Christ is clear that those that are teaching in the church that God is going to bless you if you make your pastor rich, that that is a con, that they have been consumed by greed, 
that they are distorting the faith. Now you'll have to forgive me because each time I go to look for my verses, it sends me back to the beginning. So I have to scroll through and find out where I was up to. In fact, Christ goes on to say that if you are someone who is consumed by your riches, consumed by your status in society, the temporal nature of riches, look at the, the basis of riches. Christ is talking about, Christ is talking about how people define themselves by things that are temporal, things that disappear in time. You're not going to take any of your riches to the grave. You're not going to take anything that you think defines you in terms of your possessions or experiences to the grave. These things, you're, if you're building your life on these things, you're building your life on sand. You're building your life on mud so that when the storms come and the winds and the waves batter against the house, it will collapse. But Christ is saying, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. And how do you do that? He does it by talking about good works. He talks about doing it in through good works, by having solidarity with the poor, by standing with those who are less than you, the excluded from the economy. He's setting out the, a different kind of economy, something that we'll see continues in the rest of the scriptures. He goes on to talk about, and this is directly to those who are covetous for riches, those money prosperity teaching pastors who teach make me rich and then God will bless you. This is what he says to them. After telling the story of a rich man who reflected upon his wealth and said, what will I do? And he said, you know, I'll save my money for the future. And God called him a fool and said, you fool, this very night your soul will be demanded of you. And after telling this story, he goes on to conclude, so is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. As Christians, we are called to build ourselves treasures in heaven, to be concerned by a different kind of economy, a different kind of way of conducting ourselves in terms of how we spend our time, how we spend our wealth, how we spend our resources, and it isn't based upon the narrative of consumerism that we are being taught today. And those who are prosperity teachers in the church are teaching the world in the church. They are teaching consumerism in the church. By contrast, what do the apostles teach, therefore, as real riches? But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, in all earnestness and in love we inspired in you see that you abound in this gracious work also i am also speaking this as a command but as proving i am not speaking this as a command but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also for you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now what is he talking about being rich in? He's been talking about being rich in sincerity, being rich in love, being rich in earnestness, being rich in faith, being rich in knowledge, being rich in humility, being rich in the pursuit of truth being rich in the pursuit of justice, being rich in the pursuit of a generous heart. This is the true definition of rich, according to the Apostles' teaching. Not this kind of nonsense you're hearing from the prosperity gospel preachers who are telling you that you can be rich if you tithe to make your pastor rich. He goes on to say, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. 
that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened in power through his spirit in the inner man. So the idea of richness is inverted in the Christian faith. It is a richness of character that man is supposed to pursue, not an external richness of possessions. This is true richness according to the Christian narrative. To be rich in your inner man, to be rich in those things that make you more like Christ, not prosperity in this world, not wealth in this world. If you are wealthy, you can still serve God, just like the poor man can. But it is clear from the teachings of Scripture that the definition of richness has nothing to do with the kind of prosperity teachings we hear in certain prosperity-based churches. It is an error that these churches are teaching. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. You see, when you love money, you love the things that money can allow you to do. There are many things, many sins that a man might wish to do that because of his poverty he is protected against. Don't, don't hate your poverty because there are many hearts that when they become rich, when they become wealthy, their heart becomes twisted for the love of money and they then fall away from the faith. How many Christian artists and singers who grew and developed their talents within the church, who then for the noble reason in theory of evangelizing the media world and the m world of music, then went on to lose their faith and abandon it because of their success. There are many such examples we can think of. The love of money is a root of evil. And if your heart is guided towards money and not towards God, then ultimately you will fail. Christ himself said you can't serve two masters. You can't love God and money. Now why did he say that? It's because the Jewish audience that he was speaking to would have had no other God but Yahweh, the one God. But their hearts would have dethroned God in their hearts for the love of money, which was the biggest competitor in Israeli society to the supremacy of Yahweh in the hearts of men. And it remains a danger today. People still love money. Those that are teaching a prosperity gospel in the church, the idea of a pyramid scheme where the pastor becomes rich off your tithe is someone who is loving money and not God. What does James go on to say? He says this to the rich, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass he will pass away for the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. It says in the liturgy, Remember, O man, that thou art dust, and thou shalt return unto dust. And that man is like grass, and all the glory of man is like unto the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth away. Repent and believe the gospel. Those who are basing themselves on riches, their wealth, their possessions, are basing themselves on things that will pass. They're temporal. They're an impermanent state. So build on things that are permanent. Build on things that are truly the source of all riches. Build yourself on good character. Build yourself on a noble spirit. Build yourself on a noble cause. Don't give yourself to the pursuit of riches. Give yourself to, instead to the pursuit of the kingdom of God. Christ himself said that those who 
give up mother and father and brothers and sisters and houses and homes for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom of God shall find these things given to them in abundance. This abundance is in the fellowship of the faith, that the brothers' possessions become the property of all, that the Christian community has a sense of solidarity within itself. Many a time in my life I have received the charity of my brothers and sisters who have helped me in times of trouble as I have helped my brothers and sisters in times of trouble because as Christians we have an obligation to do so. We have an obligation to build ourselves on something far more permanent than riches. And if your pastor is inviting you to build your Christian faith based upon your own blessings and riches, riches, then I invite you to give them up, to find yourself a better fellowship that is consumed by developing good character within the inner man, by defending the cause and advancing the cause of the church and the kingdom of God. Thanks be to God.